Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat, episode 294, featuring the fourth and final installment of my interview with Mr. John Cutter. In this part of the interview, we talk about his time at Big Fish, what he thinks about the casual game scene, and how it uh, parallels with the uh, Cinemaware uh, titles that he developed for the Amiga. Really interesting uh, comparisons that he draws there. Uh, we also talk about the future of gaming and get some, uh, some of the questions that you guys submitted. Anyway, there's a lot of great stuff here, so without further ado, here is Mr. John Cutter. So, after this, you went on to Big Fish? Yeah. Uh, let's see, there were a couple of, couple of stops before that. Uh, I was at Gas Powered. Oh, right, right. Again with the Chris Taylor, right? Yeah. Um, so I worked on uh, Dungeon Siege 2. I was never a huge fan of that particular game. Uh, I was playing EverQuest and World of Warcraft at the time, and I just kind of wanted the UI and the uh, control scheme to feel a little more like that. Uh, but I, I did a lot of work there, and Chris made me design director. There you go. Uh, Chris made me design director. Um, but I was kind of having a hard time pitching new ideas to him. Uh, he, he told me that he has a hard time sort of liking other people's ideas. He likes his own a little, little bit better. And I was looking for something where I could be a little more creative. So I left there and went to work at a company that was uh, making MMOs. Uh, I actually had applied for a job at Big Fish because my wife was a big fan. And they didn't really need somebody that couldn't, couldn't actually be a coder as well as a designer. So I took the job uh, at Secret Lair Studios working on MMOs, was there for about three months. Big Fish called me back and said, a position just opened. And I said, you know, I can't. I just took another job. And he said, no, just come talk to us. Just come talk to us. So I did and really liked it. And I loved casual, the casual space. So I went to work at, uh, at Big Fish and was there for about nine years. I got some questions about that, but just want to back up a little bit. So, what sure. were some of these ideas you had for Dungeon Siege Two that uh, Chris wasn't? Oh well, wait, they weren't for Dungeon Siege Two. They were for new, actually, new titles. Oh, like, brand new titles. Oh, okay. Yeah, as design director, he was he was looking to me to come up with uh, a new IP, um, and he had his own ideas, which I thought were were really uh, interesting. But again, I was kind of at a point in my career where I was I wanted to try to do my own thing. Um, and he needed somebody that could do a better job sort of supporting his vision. So I left. Well, on to the big fish. You now, my wife's a big fan of them, too. I've probably given those folks more money than any <laughs> other games publisher. That's what it feels like sometimes. Uh, you know, once you get kind of hooked on, you can sort of get hooked on those uh, hidden object and casual puzzle kind of games pretty, pretty oh, yeah. easily. Uh, I saw an interview. I think this was an interview with... Uh, where they were, yeah, this was in an interview, and you're talking about how you were kind of fed up with other publishers. You felt like they were too conservative. They weren't uh, taking any risks, and it was kind of things had moved, I guess, devolved a lot since when you've got your start in the industry. But you thought the uh, this for some reason Big Fish seemed more like that Wild West uh, of development. I'm kind of wondering if you could elaborate a little bit on that. Oh, you know when I when I was. When I first got into the industry and was working at Cinemaware, uh, there were not a lot of established, not even a lot of established genres uh, in the computer uh, game space. Um, certainly not a lot of tropes and and uh, things that sort of people expect from, you know, feature sets that people expect from certain genres. So it was kind of the sky's the limit. You know, you could do whatever you wanted. I remember I designed a boxing game when I was at Cinemaware, and I thought, you know, we can, we can do a better job since we were limited in the number of sprites and the number of moving objects we can have on the screen. We can do a better job showing off the boxers and the punches if we only show them from the waist up. So we put, uh, I think we put stats and, and other things down below, and in the upper half of the screen, we showed the upper, you know, the upper bodies of the boxers. We got to see facial expressions and kind of focus more on, you know, blows to the body, blows to the head kind of thing. Uh, and you could do that back then. Um, 
and I f- was feeling like uh, before I got into casual, I was feeling like the, the the core gamer space was much more about sort of modeling reality and sticking to again sticking to certain tropes within within the genre, and, and there was a lot less room for any kind of innovation or creativity. And even if you suggested something that was kind of new and different and and better than what people were used to, the publishers would say no, because it's just the games were getting way too expensive uh, to try something new. And with the casual space, that wasn't true anymore. And it, and it did. You know, working at Big Fish reminded me of what it was like back in the early Cinemore days when we could we could do anything. We've done quite a few games for them, right? I was looking at some on the website. I'm almost afraid to install some of these because I know they'll probably <laughs> suck up a lot of the time, my time playing them, right? The, I think uh, it was a fairway solitaire. Yeah. Which, as soon as I th- thought about that concept, I thought, that's that's a what a great concept, you know? <laughs> Golf meets solitaire. I don't know. How did that uh, idea occur to you? I, you know, I, again, I've always been a huge, I'm a golfer. I uh, played it, played at Pepperdine. Um, I love golf. Uh, my mom uh, was, we used to call her Madam Shanghai because she would play uh, Shanghai. The, the, <laughs> Madam uh, Shanghai. <laughs> ma- the, the Mahjong game would play it every single day uh, for, for hours at a time. And I wanted to come up with a game that, and my dad, you know, would, would also play Solitaire and other games like that. Uh, and I wanted to come up with a game that combined my love of golf with with a game sort of like a mahjong or, or a you know a fun solitaire game that that even my mom and dad could enjoy, uh, and it was kind of a crazy combination, a little bit like you know sardines and chocolate. Uh, golf and solitaire don't seem like they would go very well together, uh, actually. And it, it, there's I've heard a lot of people say I don't like golf, I'm not a big solitaire fan, but I love this game. And that's, that's been very gratifying. And I, I kind of have this theory that things uh, have a better chance of being hugely successful if they are, if they are sort of outside of what people are, are sort of wanting or expecting. And I sometimes use Star Wars, actually, as an example of that. And I don't know if you remember it, but science fiction was not a big... Uh, was not very popular at the box office. Um, there were movies like... You know, 2001: A Space Odyssey, and that was very artsy, and it wasn't a huge uh, financial success, I, I don't think. Uh, science fiction. Star Trek: was... The Motion Picture didn't do all that well either, huh? No, no. But but then but then Star Wars came out, and and it was it was just it was revolutionary. It just you know it was something that people were not expecting. They didn't know they really wanted it, and they just couldn't get enough of it. And I was sort of hoping that Fairway would be like that. You know, it's like. Why on earth would I want to play that game? But then everybody's telling them, oh my gosh, you've got to play this game. And I think people are more likely to spread, uh, you know, word of mouth on a game, good word of mouth, if they if it's something that they have never seen before or if it surprised them in some way. I didn't expect to like that game, but I love it. You've got to try this thing. And it's done really, really well for you, right? I think you, it was a top 10 out of it, all it, big fish games, and I, I mean these guys, I don't know if people necessarily appreciate how profitable this uh, company is, right? Yeah, the big fish has done very well. Uh, I think Fairway Solitaire is the most successful of the internally developed uh, games at Big Fish. Uh, so yeah, that's that's gratifying. It's it's done done very very well. Although it is a difficult game to advertise because when when you see an ad for it. Uh, it just doesn't look like something that, I mean, people don't click on it. If you're, if you're uh, trying to advertise a match three game, for example, people will see the ad with a little picture and they'll go, Oh, I know what that is. And they'll tap on that link and they'll, and they'll try the game out. And what we were finding with fairway was that the ads were costing us a lot more because a lot of people would see the ad, but they wouldn't click on it. So we were spending more money to get fewer click throughs. Hmm. I guess that's a, Interesting problem. I don't know. Yeah. How did they solve that to get people to... Or was it just did. word of mouth advertising? Yeah. I think a lot of it was word of mouth. And, you know, I think if Big Fish decides to do another uh, another game like that, I suspect they will try to choose a subject matter that's a little more mainstream, uh, something that would have greater kind of broad appeal. 
What about some of these other games uh, that you did there? Mystic Inn. I think you've got one, Asada, Ancient Magic. You know, are there other, any other ones that you're especially proud of? You know, uh, Big Fish actually originally hired me to, to work on their online community site. They had, uh, they were trying to, to, to get a site going similar to Electronic Arts Pogo. I don't know if you've been to Pogo. Um, it's an online game community with little, little casual games that you play. You can chat with other people. You can earn tokens, uh, spend the tokens on, you know, on avatar items and things like that. Uh, I think we had maybe, maybe 70 or so games uh, on our community site from developers all over the world. And they were looking for somebody to come in and sort of manage the internal development of, of some of those games. And I, I think after two years, I had designed eight games, and I think seven of them were in the top ten. Wow. So, so that was that was that was exciting. At the uh, Midas touch. Yeah. Uh it's uh I they were they were kind of limited before I got there. They had a very small footprint that they wanted these games to be and I shook my head and I said, no, that's come on, we we, we need I need more room to make to make better games. Um they also, I was coming to it from a little bit more of a, a hardcore background. And as I mentioned, I'd been playing a lot of EverQuest and World of Warcraft. And I knew that people were willing to spend a lot of time doing simple mundane things uh, in order to earn some kind of a reward. And the, the timing in a lot of those early um, community games were, it, you know, they wanted to make games that somebody could finish in a couple of hours. And I said, why? Let's, let's make it a 50-hour game. You've got to grind and grind and grind playing this game to earn the stuff you need to eventually finish it. And I think they all thought I was kind of crazy, but they agreed to try it. And sure enough, people people don't mind that. And especially if they're in an environment where they can chat with other people. I did yes. learn I did learn something from them though. Uh, they they uh, some of the early games that the company had worked on there were there were bad guys. Uh, they did a, a Wizard of Oz. Uh, Card game. It was Wizard of Oz, and it was uh, through the looking ga- uh, through the looking glass. And they had uh, the evil queen that would randomly pop up in the game and make you lose the hand, and she would steal some of your some of your tokens that you'd earn. And I said, "Well, how do you stop that? What is the you know what can you do strategically?" And they said, "No, it just randomly happens." And I said, "So randomly, with no you have no control over it as a player, randomly." She'll pop up and just do bad things to you and laugh and then run away. And they were like, yes. And I just kind of shook my head and I said, you guys, come on. That's, that's horrible, horrible game design. You cannot do that. But they were right because what those things were is they were chat catalysts. Because every time that would ha- happen, somebody would go, the stupid queen just stole all my stuff. And everybody would say, SS, so sorry, so sorry, so sorry. Uh, and it worked, and so we had we had villains like that in all of our games. And Fairway Solitaire has a gopher that will kind of randomly pop up and do bad stuff to you. Well, it kind of reminds me of the was the Fell Reaver in World of Warcraft that stomps you every now and then. Yeah, <laughs> it does. It gives, definitely gives you something fun to chat about. Yeah, absolutely. All right, so I just got two last questions here for you, John. Hopefully, you're not too worn out. No. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay, so I was reading that you were. I guess this is back in 2011, an interview you did in 2011. You were really excited then about the Oculus Rift. I was wondering if you still have that level of excitement and uh, if you've looked at some of the stuff that's come out since then, the, was it Microsoft and the HoloLens? And uh, there's a couple other ones. Uh, I don't can't think of the names of them right now. But, you know, what, what's kind of gotten you most excited I, you know, I, I definitely think that's the future. Um, I know there's a lot of people that are kind of kind of naysayers, and they're, you know, who wants to strap a big thing on your head where you sit around in the living room or stand in the living room and kind of move around? And but I remember thinking the same thing about the Wii, uh, thinking nobody's going to do that. I, I don't know if you remember the what was it, the Eye Toy or Magic Eye or something that came out on the PS2. Yeah, I think it's the Eye Toy. I toy, yeah, you you put it on top of your TV and there were these little games where you could see yourself and it somehow knew how you were moving and you could sort of interact with the things that were happening on the screen that you could see yourself in. And when I, somebody showed somebody showed that to me at work and I just thought, that is the coolest 
thing I have ever seen. And I stopped by on the way home from work that night and I bought one and I set it up and we played that thing that night for hours. And I woke up the next day and I could barely move. I was so sore. And I don't think we ever used it again. We used it that one time. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I thought the Wii and, and then later, you know, uh, the uh, Kinect were going to be kind of the same thing. I just thought they would be sort of flashing in the, in the pans. I guess there's, you know, to some degree they, they, they were a little bit, although Kinect is, I think, still popular and, and the Wii uh, was popular for a lot longer than I expected it to be. Uh, so I think there are people that think that the Oculus Rift is going to be a little bit like those uh, pieces of hardware, but I, had, it's, I don't know if you've tried it. Uh, I've tried, I've the, tried the it Rift. a couple of times. I haven't it got is, to play any games with it. Yeah, I haven't played any games, but I saw the latest demo. Uh, and it's, it's incredible. Yeah, I, I'm really, really excited about the future of, uh, of gaming uh, with the VR stuff that's been coming out. I can't remember. It might have been Paul Newrath. I was just talking to somebody recently about it, and he, he was saying that what really troubled him was when you reach your hands up, you don't see your hands. And for yeah. him, that was a, a deal breaker. But I don't yeah. see why they can't just create some kind of gloves or something that you could use with it, right? I mean, there must be something in the works. Yeah. In fact, I think somebody has, has been experimenting with something like that. Um, and I know some of the guys over at, uh, over at Oculus, and I think they're take on that is yeah it's nice to be able to see your hands it does does feel strange to not see them but there's no tactile uh feel there's no i mean yeah you can see your hand moving around in the scene but if you're going to do anything with it mm. it it just doesn't it feels like a ghost and it and it so it doesn't help as much as everyone thinks i think is their their feeling that seems like a pretty significant challenge that needs to be overcome there i can't even imagine how it would work where you could actually feel something exactly yeah maybe maybe a haptic glove or something it's probably something that works yeah i think the control you know what kind of a controller you're going to use with these things is a, is a big issue i remember the very first demo uh of the first oculus rift that i got you know i sat down in a chair and my friend put it on my head and 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 then he had to like take my hands and put them on the keyboard so i could actually move around and oh well, that's kind of awkward <laughs> but yeah it's it's. I think it's going to be huge. I remember. I remember telling. I was going to say. I remember telling my wife uh, when we first started playing EverQuest, and both got really, really addicted to EverQuest. And I remember telling her, if there ever comes a time where I can strap something on my head and be in this world, swinging a sword and throwing fireballs, and I will stop going to work. And I don't think we're very far away from that, actually. Yeah, I mean, I'm the same way. You know, if, if these worlds can just, if it could be that immersive, it kind of does make you wonder, well, why would you want to leave <laughs> and quit yeah. playing, go do something? I mean, I guess you have still have to eat. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I remember when I was when I was playing EverQuest and playing World of Warcraft, I just thought, why would I ever want to play a single-player game again? This is, this is the future. I was so addicted, and I don't play them as much as I used to anymore. In fact, I'm not playing an MMO at all right now. And I think one of the things that I missed was actually being able to finish a story. I love being in the world. I love being immersed in the world and exploring and adventuring. And but sometimes I just kind of want to, you know, I want to complete something. Um, so I'm, I'm sort of back to single player games now. Yeah, I agree with that. It's nice when you complete a game and you, it's almost like check, you know, done. I've done that. I've like Pillars of Eternity. I don't know if you played that one, but. I I beat it. <laughs> you know, I can go back and play it again if I want to, but you just have a feeling of accomplishment. Yeah. Uh, whereas in a game like World of Warcraft, sometimes it really just feels like you're doing a... I got a friend that jokes about doing the daily chores. <laughs> yeah. It's like it's never going to end. You know, there's always going to be these endless chores. Right. All right, so here's the last question I got for you. Uh, this is uh, from a viewer. You might know who the viewer is after you hear the question. I, I don't know. We'll see. John... Are you into dogs? <laughs> I don't know why he thought that was so funny. Uh, yeah, that's that's a, that's funny. That's sort of been a catchphrase between Neil and I for years. Um, I was we were we were both big fans of Dean Koontz. Um, I have since moved on to to uh, uh, fantasy writers, and it's sort of hard for me to go back and read Stephen King and, and Koontz and some of those guys because the stories just feel 
so simple now. And um, but anyway, at the time we were big fans, and uh, there was a my favorite book uh, of his, one of my favorite books of all time, uh, was called Watcher. And I think I think Neil had been had just discovered Dean Koontz or, or maybe had been reading some other stuff. And the watcher is about this very, very intelligent dog. And I remember walking up to Neil cause he was talking about books. And I said, Neil, are you into dogs? Cause I wanted to tell him about the watcher and he, he's got this very, you know, bigger than life laugh. And I remember he just started laughing. I think he laughed for five minutes. It just caught him the wrong way. And that's sort of been a, been a phrase <laughs> between us ever since every time we see each other, I'm into dogs, John. <laughs> well john is there anything else that uh, you wanted to mention or talk about that we haven't covered already um I, you know again i've been in the industry for a long time mm. got lots and lots of stories which is partly why i uh, put that website together that's a great website I'm, I'm gonna direct everybody to watch this video to go check that out great thanks um yeah i just i, I you know the problem is, is I, I've always been so focused on, on making games that I haven't really, you know, I, I, I never collected, uh, you know, awards that, that my games have won. Uh, I don't have, I think I've probably got a copy of The Trail at Condor, maybe Defender of the Crown around somewhere, but I don't have any of my old games. I just, I've always been focused more on the future than on kind of looking back. And now that I'm getting a little bit older, I, I thought, you know, I want to kind of remember some of those things. So I, I'm hoping the website will be a place that is, as these things occur to me or as I, you know, remember something else or a funny story that I, you know, I can go there and, and, and keep track of all that stuff. So I keep it all in one place. That's great. I, was, I guess I, I do have one more question. Sure. I, I noticed you've got some, it looks like maps up on the wall back there. Is that from games or is that, are those real maps? What, what, what are those? Oh, the, uh, this one is actually the province of Skyrim. Um, oh, okay. Back when I was playing Skyrim, we had uh, had some some friends of the family that uh, that put that together. They put it in a nice frame, and uh, and these are actually this is uh, Ultima Online map, and I think that was one of the expansions for for Ultima. My wife and I were were big fans of uh, of UO. I don't know if you ever played it, but a phenomenal game. I played it a little bit. Is that so you sound like you've played pretty much all the MMOs or a good uh, slew, maybe the most popular ones. At certainly certainly for the first uh, few years. I haven't played, again, I haven't played them a lot recently, but yeah, I mean, Ultima Online, EverQuest, World of Warcraft. Uh, I just felt like there's a big, you know, when you go from Ultima Online to EverQuest, that was a big leap. And uh, from EverQuest to WoW, I think was also a big leap. But, you know, it's, it's, if you would have told me back, when did a WoW come out, like 2007 or so? something like that i don't remember exactly. i'm just amazed that it's just remained i would have thought by now there would have been something else that would have you know did did what you know they did to everquest but i don't know what it is about that game's a staying power well i think it's it's so hard uh you know that's a game that now has what 15 years or something of content 10 years or i feel like they just celebrated an anniversary it was like eight years or 10 years anyway um, it's got so many years of content that uh, it's just hard for anybody else to compete because everybody will compare any MMO that comes out, they will compare it to WoW. And if it doesn't have you know, as, as much stuff, as many dungeons, as many zones, if the world isn't as big, then it's, it doesn't compare very well. And so it's really, really hard. I think I heard in an interview, somebody had said, if you wanted to compete, I mean, really compete against World of Warcraft with an MMO, uh, both in terms of development dollars and marketing, and it would cost you a billion dollars. And that's all for this week's episode. Hope you guys enjoyed that. I uh, should be back next week, hopefully with a review of the game Serpent in the Staglands, uh, which just came out not too long ago. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 much if you have supported Matt Chat. It is amazing what you guys have done. Uh, it really means a lot to me. Uh, whatever you can afford, whatever you think this show is worth, just go to the Patreon site in the show notes and sign up. That will get you access to those exclusive Google Air Hangouts 
and uh, other podcasts and things that only are available to those supporters at any level. So uh, go check that out. Uh, let's see. What about that news from the Matt Cave? All right, so I kind of gave away, I kind of spoiled my old news segment by mentioning Serpent in the Staglands, because that's one of the big things that just came out. I've uh, been playing it a lot. I, I should have, I didn't check to see how many hours I've got into it, but it, it feels <laughs> like a lot. Uh, there's still some bugs are working out, uh, but overall, it's, it's really been uh, fun for me. It's a very challenging game, uh, that's for sure. Uh, but, you know, that's not going to stop a guy. Uh, guys like us from playing it. Um, a little early to say conclusively, but I'm, think, I'm, I'm pretty comfortable recommending it to you guys. Uh, go check it out. Uh, if bugs and things like that, though, are really irritating for you, you might want to wait a while until the uh, next patch. But they've done a pretty good job so far of keeping it a patch. So, uh, anyway, really excited about that. Let me know what you guys think if, you, if you've been playing it. I've only hit a couple of bugs myself. Uh, nothing too catastrophic. Uh, nothing that makes me not want to play it, so... Uh, let's see what else is in the news. Uh, also, of course, uh, Bard's Tale 4 uh, Kickstarter has launched, and they were trying to raise uh, one or one point one and a quarter million dollars. They've already got the million, and uh, that's just after a couple days, I think. So they got 34 days left to raise this quarter million. I don't think they're going to have any problem. Uh, and go go check that out. I know a lot of you guys are jealous of my uh, Pillars of Eternity collectible box. You know, I think it's well worth uh, the extra money to get those boxes. Uh, I think Bard's Tale has a couple of them. I went for the uh, collector's version of that, too, which I think is about a hundred and something. You know, again, seems like a lot, but, you know, you get what you pay for with stuff like this. If you want that nice box, you got to pay a little extra. Okay, what else? Uh, let's see. Uh, Shane Stax, he's a good friend of the show, a personal friend. He just interviewed, he's got a radio show uh, a real radio show, terrestrial radio, whatever you want to call it, show. And uh, he interviewed the Coles, Lorianne and Corey Cole, about their Hero University, Hero U project. Uh, I don't know if I mentioned, I think I mentioned this. Uh, they're trying to raise 100000 They sort of had to come back to do a second Kickstarter. I guess it came up a little short. Um, they got nine days left on that. They're trying to raise 100000 They've raised 826 So I think they'll probably make that you know, I went ahead and I pledged again to those those folks. Pretty nice perks for doing that. Uh, plus, I don't know what would happen if they don't make this. Oh, you know, I hate to think that they, the game wouldn't materialize. That would suck. Uh, so just go just go check it out. You know, try not to uh, jump to conclusions on that. Uh, take a look at their pledge or take a look at their uh, pitch video with the Kickstarter page for it, and then uh, pony up as you feel it warrants. Oh, uh, one last thing, also by Shane Stacks. Uh, he sent me a link to the RPG Codex. Apparently they have a... Uh, they're talking about the new artwork for the Seven Dragons Saga game. And they had a, a clip there. It looks like they've... Uh, yeah, there's the clip there. You can see the redesign on that. I guess this guy's a samurai. So it looks like they're getting geared up to try again with a Kickstarter. <laughs> you know, hopefully they'll have better luck next time. I was really disappointed they didn't do better, but, you know... Maybe they've learned from the mistakes of that first pitch and will blow us away with the second one. So uh, stay tuned to that. I know a lot of you guys uh, like me are quite enamored with the old gold box series. We'd like to see it return in some fashion. So keep your fingers crossed. Hopefully we'll be hearing more about that soon. All right. What about that ale of the week? Yeah, I don't really know what that was either. Okay. What have I got here? I've got a curmudgeon. Curmudgeon, old ale brewed with molasses and oak aged. That sounds quite intriguing. Got a nice picture of an old man there on the cover. He looks like the <laughs> curmudgeon-y. <laughs> uh, let's see. Founders Brewing Company out of Grand Rapids, Michigan. Uh, let's see what else. Government warning. You know, I think all governments should come with a warning. Uh, let's see. Founders Brewing. Well, oh, there's a little bit. <laughs> wow, uh, 9.8 percent alcohol by volume. That is really strong indeed. Uh, usually they don't get that close to 10 percent. That is, this is definitely going to have a kick to it. 
of 50 IBUs. I don't really see much else on the bottle here to talk about. Um, curmudgeon, 9.8% alcohol. I guess that's really all they think you need to know. <laughs> anyway, let's get this thing open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this curmudgeon here in the rather excellent drinking horn. I'm thinking already that the curmudgeon must be a connoisseur of ale because, I mean, the aroma coming off of this is magnificent. It's a very chocolatey coffee. Uh, you can also smell a little bit of that oak. They talked about it being uh, aged in oak barrels, so you get a little bit of a smoky uh, aroma to it, but it's, it's all very, very aromatic. Just smells wonderful. Let uh, me give, give it a taste, though. <laughs> I can't believe. Let me try one more time. Well, it's, it's really amazing that there's 10% alcohol in this because it is almost uh, deadly smooth. I mean, you really do not taste any alcohol in this at all. It's very chocolatey, a little bit of a coffee flavor, maybe just a hint of bitterness, a bit of a. Uh, you definitely have those uh, sort of scotch aromas in there, or sc uh, scotch flavors in there. Uh, a little bit of smokiness in the flavor, uh, but all in all, it's really, really smooth. Uh, just really great texture. Uh, I'm really enjoying it, actually. Let me try it one more time here. Now, just, you know, a perfect ale, I think. You know, dare I say it. It's definitely at the uh, top of my list. Uh, curmudgeon found by uh, Founders. I mean, really remarkable, uh, wonderful taste on this. It's smooth. It's uh, got a, a lot of alcohol, but you really don't taste it. Um, just something really, uh, really good. So I'm going to go a full five out of five drinking horns on that. I uh, definitely recommend it. Uh, curmudgeon by Founders. All right, let's wrap this up with a quotation. So for the quotation this week, I was looking for quotations about dogs because I really like the little uh, inside joke between Neil and uh, John. And I found this one by Charles de Gaulle. It goes something like this. The better I get to know men, the more I love dogs. <laughs> See you guys next week.